Hello, and welcome to this webinar. We're very excited to be kicking off this series of webinars that are addressing various issues around equity and assessment. This is the very first webinar, so you are joining us at the initiation of this series, and we will be focusing on different subjects within the theme of equity over the next four to six months. The goal of assessment across the board is not only to diagnose individuals, but to create recommendations for interventions that benefit the client and help mitigate or prevent adverse outcomes. So knowledge and incorporation of a client's personal background and environment are necessary for culturally relevant and competent assessments. We will begin this series on equity with a historical perspective. So a look back on how we got here and then continue with today on talking about how we mitigate some of these um, issues that have come up during test development to address bias and equity within those. Um, while millions of people have been aided by psychological assessment over the years, there have also been people that have not benefited from these use of the instruments over the years. And so with that said, I'm going to turn this over to Peter Entwistle so we can take a look back at where we came from. Very good. Thank you. As Lisa said, my name is Peter Entwistle, and I'm speaking to you today from Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. Our agenda is going to be as follows. I'm going to be the one talking about the history of psychological testing, and that will only take a few minutes. Then we're going to move into the subject of reducing bias in assessment, and we'll look at the subject of bias, the subject of equity and fairness, and then we'll move into the subject of looking forward. So I'm going to begin with an examination of how the early tests were developed and used, the purposes of those tests, and the rising awareness of methods that can be used to address bias and the subject of equity. So here are a group of questions that I think we need to explore. How far have we come? What were the early days of psychological testing like? When did this happen? And how were these tests used and for whom? Where were they developed and used? And what was the purpose behind them? Who created some of these tests? And where was that? And at the outset, were there mistakes or possible misuse or abuses of testing? So as we look at the history, we have to recognize that for every step forward, there might actually be a burden or a uh, problem that we're carrying forward. Some of you may not be aware that some of the earliest testing was actually created in China, in the Song Dynasty. And that was approximately 3,000 years ago. That's 2000 BC. And some of those tests that were developed were uh, created to identify people who could be mandarins in the Chinese culture. So what did they have to know? They were tested in civil law, military affairs, agriculture, revenue, geography. And later on, there was a focus on whether they knew about the Confucian classics. And at that time, very few people passed those uh, rather rigorous tests. But as you can see, measures of problem solving, divergent thinking and creativity were included. And so you couldn't argue that these were specific measures of intelligence, but certainly knowledge of civil law and fiscal policy were incorporated, along with a, a requirement that the a person showed good uh, penmanship, which could be re read and therefore communicated. In Europe, meantime, there was a subject called phrenology or cranioscopy that was created. And this aligned with the scientific approach at the time, because it was believed that phrenology promoted uh, the idea that mental and behavioral qualities were related to the shape of the skull. So the individuals with bumps and depressions uh, actually were reflecting uh, brain fiber that was pushing on the outside of that skull. So these ideas actually reinforced preconceived notions about the mental capacity. 
And as you can imagine, there were systemic differences between the head size or circumference of the female brain versus the male brain, which led to the belief that males were somehow superior because they had bigger heads. Along came uh, Darwin, who challenged the current scientific ethos, challenged the theology of the day with his origin of species. And a colleague of his was Galton, who was looking at the link between heredity and uh, intellectual functioning. So there were origins in Europe. Some of the earliest were German psychologists, including Fechner, Weber, Wilhelm Wundt, and others that created the scientific foundation for psychology. In fact, Wundt referred to himself as a psychologist. Meanwhile, in the country I come from, England, Galton and his colleagues had conceptualized mental abilities in the context of evolution and looked at the importance of individual differences. So that German experimental psychologist, Wilhelm Wundt, was a teacher to many famous figures in the field of psychology and assessment. And these included such individuals as Charles Spearman, Victor Henri from France, Emil Kreplin from uh, Germany, along with the Americans Edward Titchener, Stanley Hall, and James McKean Cattell. So he was really quite influential in terms of the students that came to his lab. Now, the lab that he created in Leipzig in, in 1879, rather, uh, was one of the first places where uh, mental abilities were being evaluated. And we refer to this time period as the brass instrument period because there was a focus on scientific instrumentation. And uh, as you can imagine, he uh, created uh, a lot of research that would now be viewed as experimental psychology. And they looked at such things as reaction to sounds and reaction to visual stimuli, touch, taste, and smell. And uh, what Wundt argued is that you could measure a lot of different functions of individuals. And with the increasing industrialization, uh, the need for good reaction time and physical skills clearly uh, was something that was very much in demand for the economy and the state of industry. Meanwhile, in the UK, Sir Francis Galton uh, was doing his own work. And what you may know about Galton is that he really uh, was a scientist who believed that anything is measurable. And he looked at such things as reaction time and sensory discrimination. But that's not all he's known for. Uh, he also had looked at the subject of beauty and how boring lectures were, the efficacy of prayer, and so forth. So he had some wide-ranging interests. And for those of you who are familiar with that history, you know that he had developed a number of nonverbal sensory motor tests and reaction time experiments, including measures of sensory discrimination, such as the two-point touch that neurologists use to this day. As a scientist, uh, he also created a number of terms, such as regression to the mean, and the correlation coefficient. One of his colleagues from London University was Carl Pearson, who's no relation to the company Pearson, but Pearson was the person who developed uh, such statistics as the product moment correlation coefficient, chi-square, and some other coefficients. Now, on the subject of Galton, he was somebody who thought that taste and to some extent, physical attributes could be correlated with the overall intelligence of the individual. And if you think about such things as, can you distinguish different types of wine? Can you discern whether it's a Merlot or a Cabernet uh, from the taste? Sometimes people are referred to as having discriminating palates. In other words, the ability to discriminate taste was seen as somehow more sophisticated. And some of that thinking uh, is still in existence today. But what we know about Galton was some of that emphasis on sensory motor functioning really was misguided. And in the end, uh, it led to uh, a lack of progress in conceptualizing what intellectual functions really were. Early in the test movement, uh, we found that uh, there was an attempt uh, by uh, certain individuals, uh, such as Goddard, uh, 
to suggest that um, individuals who are immigrating to uh, America uh, could be evaluated. And as many as 28 million immigrants who came through Ellis Island uh, were being screened uh, initially by physicians. And after a while, Goddard had suggested in 1910 that perhaps he and his team should play a role in the evaluation of people coming from other parts of the world. This has been described in some detail uh, by authors Gelb and Gould. And uh, one of the questions that faces us is, can the uh, use of psychological testing play a role in the selection and immigration of individuals? And at the time, there was a real concern that individuals weren't able to perform very well on measures of intelligence that Goddard was administering. However, as Gold pointed out, if a person fails to understand the English language because that's not their primary language and they're coming from countries such as Russia or they have a Slavian Eastern background, would they be able to cooperate with the testing? And as Gould said at the time, there was concern that some of those individuals were not doing well on the tests that were being administered to them and were therefore being viewed as being feeble-minded. Gould pointed out in 81 that it's ridiculous to think that so many individuals who may be uh, speaking um, a Slavic or Russian languages would be deemed to be feeble-minded and therefore that they were becoming a menace. But even in those days, you can see that Goddard uh, thought that he could make this uh, examination of immigrants uh, perhaps more scientific and also uh, it would be able to uh, assist in uh, planning and in the, uh, so let's say, selection or support of individuals coming in from different parts of the world. Meanwhile, um, there was a different focus in Europe, and that was with the education of children, there was concern about whether there was a way to evaluate children and to classify those who may be able to uh, require uh, a special kind of education. And so the uh, Minister of Education, Public Instruction in Paris, uh, around the time 1904, uh, uh, had a commission uh, to look into whether there was a uh, approach that could be used to classify and screen children uh, who uh, would not be able to profit from regular public education. Uh, what I learned also is that the attempt was to try to identify children who could uh, profit from instruction, whose ability might otherwise be camouflaged or submerged by poverty and the conditions at the time. So early on, uh, Binet actually um, created a test uh, based upon approximately 300 children between the ages of 3 and 13. And the purpose of that was to see if they could classify children who may be uh, viewed as uh, either mentally retarded or in some way intellectually disabled. So the purpose initially was to help identify children who would profit from special education, but who may not benefit from the regular public education that was available at the time. So it's important to recognize that this classification did lead the initial uh, effort towards special education. So in 1905, Binet and his colleague from the Sorbonne, Simon, uh, were amongst the first to uh, create a measure for children. It was uh, serving as a model for years to come, and it was, uh, it was elaborated in 1908 and again uh, in 1911, um, and a much larger number of items were included. And the concept of a mental age was then created by Binet to help identify the children's performance. A turban uh, took that same test, translated it into uh, English from its original French, and with um, a uh, renorming in the US, uh, was able to administer it to a much larger number of individual children. Meanwhile, uh, while the schools had provided a platform initially for uh, the testing, it was also true that the uh, First World War gave impetus to the need for a wide-scale assessment. So 
uh, Yerkes from Harvard uh, was among the first to suggest that, uh, that when you look at the uh, 1.75 million uh, military recruits for the First World War, uh, that it would help to select uh, officer material and uh, help identify uh, strengths of some of those uh, candidates. And this was also the time when a nonverbal measure, the Army Beta, was created. And this was intended to be used for individuals who might be considered illiterate or whose first language was not English. So just know that early on, the Alpha did rely a great deal on individuals who could read and comprehend the English language and be able to perform verbal tasks. But the Beta uh, was able to identify individuals who may have very strong nonverbal skills and who would be able to benefit from having somebody use pantomime and gesture at the front of the uh, room to help them understand what the task is. So the assumption is that the individuals will be able to use paper and pencil and show their ability. Uh, it's not clear that uh, Yerke's uh, significant statistical work was ever really uh, helpful to the military, uh, but it is uh, recognized that this was the first time a large number of individuals were being uh, evaluated, and uh, it went to show that the uh, tests could be done in a large group setting. Over that 100-year span, uh, we can see the uh, growth of other measures. Uh, Woodworth had created a uh, measure for personality that perhaps may be viewed as uh, a forerunner of the now famous MMPI. But in addition to that, um, individuals such as Thurstone or Olpert um, had also created measures of personality before Hathaway and McKinley. In addition to that, we see the Swiss psychiatrist uh, trying to uh, create ink blots that would be helpful and uh, disclosing personality features that the person may be unaware of or unconscious of. Uh, and of course, uh, Exner uh, tried to standardize the scoring of those same projectives. Again, at Harvard, we see Murray and Morgan, who had developed a TAT, a thematic apperception test for normal individuals that again may show how they are able to uh, perceive a social situation and uh, generate a narrative about it. In addition, uh, there was a test called the Carnegie, uh, which looked at interest inventories and Strong uh, and CUDA had created uh, variations Akudas was an ipsative measure, but Strong uh, was the initial creator of the Strong Vocational Interest Blank that became known as the Strong Campbell. Um, was very interested in seeing how individuals may perform on the test and show their preferences, likes and dislikes. In addition to that, we see the emergence of neuropsychological tests. As we said here, some of these were as early as 1920. And of course, the MMPI, the Wexler Scales, uh, are very familiar to us at Pearson uh, since they were created by the Psychological Corporation. And uh, Cattell was one of the first uh, individuals initially at Columbia who was then uh, created the uh, Psych Corporation back in 1921. So we're now celebrating 100 years. What were the consequences of the perhaps misuse or abuse of some of those tests that I've described? Well, one of the issues is that we see an overdiagnosis of pathology amongst particularly disadvantaged populations, different ethnic backgrounds and different socioeconomic status, but still we see an overdiagnosis and a tendency for individuals from different ethnic uh, groups uh, to be disproportionately represented in special education. That was, in fact, the impetus behind the development of one of our uh, language tests. Uh, the uh, author had said he wanted to cut down on the number of individuals who might be referred for speech and language services because they were inappropriately diagnosed as having a language disorder. We also see a, a lack of representation in the individuals who might be considered gifted. And what we also recognize is that individuals who may have uh, been on the receiving end of psychological testing uh, may have had a lasting effect uh, on their uh, performance and their accomplishments.
And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa, who's going to describe for you how we can then move on from this position where we found ourselves. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, I uh, want to kind of reiterate that a lot of these early measures that Peter described were really not designed for use in a wide variety of cultures. They were um, geared towards the mainstream cultures of the um, countries in which they were developed. And this kind of persisted for a long time. It really wasn't until the 80s that cultural um, impacts on test results and some of these consequences of these early uh, biases in these tests came to uh, prominent investigation. And really this is about the time that you, got, you get to see um, more cultural tests being developed and um, a big emphasis put on uh, cultural fairness or cultural um, equivalence. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of terms that came out of that time. Uh, and that brings us to today when we're developing tests now, one of our biggest goals is making sure that our tests are as unbiased as we can create them. Now, that said, all tests are kind of in created within a culture uh, in which they're intended to be used. So we try to minimize our test bias in development. So let me define test bias as we use it internally. Um, and ac actually within the assessment industry, test bias refers to the differential validity of test scores across groups. So um, different ages, different education backgrounds, different cultures, um, racial backgrounds, um, gender in other words, these groups are differentially um, valid. These test scores are differentially valid in these groups. So therefore, they can be considered of having different meanings within those groups. Um, bias is something that we can empirically test. And so I'm going to talk about some of the ways in which we uh, address and assess for bias as we are developing our measures. Um, test bias is very closely affiliated with another freight term called test fairness. And test fairness really uh, applies to the process and the systems in which tests are used. So are the test is a test fair, a test is treated amongst all test takers. They all have equal access to the testing process. There is an absence of measurement bias in the measures that are being used. Um, there is justifiable validity of all of the test scores and interpretation is measured with it. So fairness is not necessarily an aspect that we can easily measure while developing a test. It's, it involves the entire process in which a test is used. So um, one, uh, one way of looking at this is we call it bias within the test. So this is what we look for internally when we're developing tests and which is examined in the research literature after a test is published as well. And then there's fairness within the process, excuse me. So within bias, we are gonna look at construct bias, method bias, item bias, and predictive bias. And I'm gonna talk about how these were historically uh, a problem and how we address them now in our test development process. And then we're gonna get into the fairness within the process. And we're gonna talk about referral and screening, um, test selection and assignment, situational bias, and interpretation issues. Um, and these are these are things that um, is sort of challenging across all of our field of are we falling into some of these um, systemic issues of how our tools are used. So uh, let's start with, oh, I did not move forward. Hold on. With method bias. So, oh, nope, sorry, construct. Did it move? Yeah, construct bias. So when we talk about construct bias, we're talking about the actual constructs that are defined within a test and how they are um, the same or similar across cultures or how they are different across cultures. A test would be considered had to have construct bias if the constructs being directly measured by the measure differ across cultures. So for example, depression frequently manifests its way in manifests itself in different ways across cultures. So if a measure only measures one way of the expression of depression, it would be potentially exhibiting construct bias. 
So you would want to have a measure that was a set that assessed the, all the different ways of behavior, of behavioral manifestations of depression in the populations that that test was designed to be used with. So historically, this has been a problem because there has been a singular cultural reference point for many of our very um, early tests. Um, and it would have contained inappropriate content for all groups assessed. Perhaps um, the, the items may have reflected a more middle to upper class culture instead of um, including some low SES or um, it, groups that have different than mainstream background. It may have not covered a content area uh, completely. Maybe it covered the areas that fit the mainstream culture but didn't quite capture the areas uh, that were not in that mainstream. It may also only focus on one area within a larger construct. For example, phonological processing tests, if you use them, um, assess different areas within language, but very commonly across languages, one construct may not apply in another um, culture. For example, rhyming is a very common experience for English language uh, in the English language. Um, rhyming is in um, even pre-K and early childhood reading materials, but um, that is not, rhyming is not necessarily um, relevant in other languages. So, in, you know, just doing a straight translation across those might introduce construct bias into that construct. So how do we currently address this in our test development? First, we get customer input repeatedly. There are multiple ways that we um, get customer input, but usually at the beginning of a test, we go out and we survey current users of a test and ask, what are you seeing that might not um, fit the, pro the clients you're uh, working with? And we get a lot of information on construct issues here, particularly in areas where constructs aren't being measured. So this is kind of the inadequate coverage a, we would like to see this included in this type of measure. We get expert reviews on all of our content, and this includes global reviews, so not just a US-centric focus, but also including all of our global colleagues um, in, in Europe and in um, India, in Brazil, that all participate in these global reviews early on in our content development. Um, they are very good at identifying things that are US-centric or that are may, may be out of um, out of uh, they, something that the, someone in their country would not be able to understand just because of a content issue. We also examine the psychometric properties of constructs across groups. This includes factor analysis across groups to see if the factors hold for this, the constructs they're measuring across different populations. And something that um, we also do is we examine alternative responsibilities for acceptability. If you look back at some of the early tests um, some of the uh, items, and we'll get into item bias here in a second, would include uh, both correct and incorrect responses. And the incorrect responses might have been correct responses within a cultural context, but within the scoring system, they were counted as incorrect. Well, this would obviously uh, reduce the scores for those populations where that was um, the familiar experience. Next, we have method bias. So this is anything in the structure, the methods of the tests that differentially impact groups. So um, wording ambiguity, uh, familiarity with instructions, um, familiarity with the testing session, um, poor sample representation. So early measures like the MMPI, the original MMPI and the original WISC and WACE were standardized on white populations, often in middle class and didn't have a wide variety of educational backgrounds. So um, these obviously would impact if the scores for those that were then tested using that as their sample of reference. Uh, administration or scoring subjectivity, anytime that um, an examiner needs to weigh in um, on a score that is not very clearly explicitly spelled out in terms of criteria, it can introduce some difficulty in terms of method bias. Assumptions of the background knowledge on test procedures. Not everyone understands, you know, that speed or accuracy um, trade-off in terms of working quickly, and they, the importance of being fast and the importance of being accurate also vary across cultures. 
So those types of things can be a, be a problem um, in earlier versions of tests. And also language requirements. I think Peter referred to the Ellis Island testing. Everyone there was tested in English, even though many of the immigrants that went through there didn't speak any English, but their scores were recorded based on their English um, administrations. Uh, and obviously there were lasting effects to that in terms of political and socioeconomic um, outcomes. So how do we currently address this? Um, we also use experts for this portion of the test. Um, we test a lot of early pro prototypes of our measures with various populations and sp specifically elicit feedback in those uh, populations where it may not be as familiar as we think it is. Um, during testing, we uh, ask the examiner and client to provide feedback on their familiarity with the test and how easy it was to learn the procedures and um, adjust as appropriate. Uh, we currently stratify our samples matched to census proportion. So instead of seeking out one single um, reference group, we are looking for a sample that matches a census target um, that is you know, gathered on the national level. Um, we also collect very large samples on high stakes measures. So if you think about a stratified sample, um, if you have a sample of 50 per age band, if you if five percent of the population is the Native American population or other um, Pacific Islanders, only one person out of that fifty is going to be fall into that five percent. However, if you have two hundred, that's a much larger number that is being represented across um, not just within that age band, but also across the entire sample. So we do collect large samples on our high stakes measures to ensure that representation is there. And we also oversample to develop subgroup norms. Um, and this it allows us to create demographic subgroups for comparisons, adjustments to our norms. Many of our measures um, in the past 20 years had gender based norms as well as uh, overall norms that could be used for um, childhood behavior differences. And you could examine those at the subgroup level as opposed to the overall level. Okay. So um, there's been some recent um, discussion on the use of these demographic adjustments. And I, I wanna point out this um, article that Posen and her colleagues uh, put out. And currently we, stratify our samples based on things that we can find in the U.S. Census, so demographics. And they are, that we should also be potentially looking at these other areas, because these are things that are known to impact performance on uh, brain health and also other areas. So these are interesting areas to look at in um, nativity and acculturation. So maybe we have an opportunity now to start thinking about the way that we stratify and norm um, our products, or even that we collect additional data so that we can look at this type of information in relation to performance. Um, in particular, literacy has been shown. Uh, I know that there has been, or there was an article by um, Fauffer, I'm probably totally saying that name wrong. Um, sorry. By Fife and colleagues who looked at differences in episodic memory between African Americans and Caucasians and found that the difference between the scores obtained on those measures were almost entirely explained by the literacy levels um, in, in the group. So maybe this is a chance that we can open the discussion to how do we address these types of issues, which show a much um, bigger influence than some of the measures that we currently um, stratify by. All right, next item bias. So. This is a, a form of method bias, but it's at the, at the micro level. So this would be a bias of an individual item within a test. So maybe the item itself has content that is not as familiar across groups or is not as relevant to individuals across those groups, or those groups don't have the same experiences with that content over time. Um, so maybe the response requirements required by the test um, are just not familiar. Also translations can um, not adapt appropriately. So it's, it's sometimes translations are, uh, are not cross-culturally relevant. Um, and there may just be ambiguity in the phrasing of a particular item so that different groups may interpret that in a different way. 
So some historical problems we've seen is, again, the cultural context and differential familiarity and differential scoring. Um, so we address these in similar ways that we address the method bias. We just look at it at more of a micro level. Um, we do have an editorial policy here in um, Pearson, and all of our instruments that are published go through review by this policy. And this ensures that we um, are addressing any any content in our measures that might be offensive to any groups. So we ensure that these uh, all of our tools are not offensive or controversial in terms of the content. They don't reinf reinforce stereotypical views of any client group. Um, and that they're free of racial, ethnic, gender, socioeconomic, economic, and other forms of bias. So while at an item, you may see, you know, the depiction of a woman um, is as a teacher. If you look at the set of items across a subtest, you will also see women in non-stereotypical roles and vice versa. So um, it is important to look at items individually, but also within the context of their entire item set. We also, over the years, have added um, the depictions of individuals in our uh, materials have become more multicultural to be more inclusive of the populations that we're testing. Uh, expert reviews, you can see that's coming up a lot. And we also use our global reviewers for this as well as our examiner and client feedback. Something unique to item bias, though, is our differential analyses. This is our item response theory. We look at actually how these items are functioning across designated groups. And this can indicate um, problematic items that we may want to look further into for either revision or um, not non-inclusion in future rounds. All right. And finally, within um, the test bias is predictive bias. And um, this is when test results are differentially um, effective in predicting the outcome across groups. So if the outcome desired is academic achievement or academic success, maybe the test is not predicting one group as well as it does another. So historically, um, this has resulted in some of the overrepresentation we see in special education or underrepresentation in some of the higher level classes. Um, inappropriate placement in um, non-education classes or edu non-educable -educa classes. Um, those are not as common nowadays as they have been historically, but they frequently were placed in those types of classes um, earlier. And it also has differential prediction of long-term outcomes, such as college success. The SAT has struggled a lot with this issue and has done a lot of work to try and reduce, uh, to increase their predictive uh, ability across groups. Uh, and they've done this by trying to include some additional measures, some of the ones that we saw earlier in that slide um, from POSIN, but also other measures of like economic background, school quality, those types of things that might predict, help improve the prediction of success. So now I want to turn attention away from the individual test, but how that test is now used within the systems that they um, are in. Schools are probably the biggest system in which testing are used, but the healthcare system and um, the court systems also see a lot, can be considered a system. So the first area that might produce some systemic issues is um, the referral process. So think about who the referral originator is in your system. Is it a particular doctor if you're in a hospital, or is it a particular group um, or a um, division that's always originating referrals? In the school systems, is your teacher the source of referral or is it parent referral? If it's parent for referral, do parents within the system get some kind of training or information on how to make those referrals? Are parents equally aware of the services that are available if they seek referral? Um, or are only the or are the people being referred only the ones who have you know some inside knowledge of the system? So uh, kind of look for those types of bias. If it's a teacher that's making the referral, are teachers equally trained in their ability to um, determine who needs uh, who needs to be sent for evaluation or who might be you know the gifted child in the room? Um, are there some biases within the system that are 
encouraging the continuation of um, inequity in the outcomes. Um, referrals are not always based on um, impartial objective grounds. You know, I think we've all heard the term boys will be boys, but girls get referred for the same behaviors. So um, does the training that's offered to the referral sources kind of fit um, the needs of students and who's gonna be getting referred? Uh, examine referral rates for your groups of interest. Are certain subgroups being referred for the same types of issues? Over time, maybe there's some training that needs to be addressed there, or maybe you need to be seeking referrals for certain types of populations as well. Um, but when we look at some, a lot of systems have gone to a universal screening, um, but look at your screening too. Check out your referral rates based on the screenings. Are certain subgroups being excluded based on certain criteria that are part of the screening? Or is funding an issue in terms of um, who gets seen and who doesn't? Um, how often are people being sent outside of your system to get you know, treated or, or assessed as opposed to in system? And if, is the wait time differential because of who gets referred or who, who is prioritized? And why are people prioritized? So that's those are good questions to ask. Um, in terms of funding, you also in many states have special education limits. Um, a lot of these are now being challenged in court, but in several states, those still exist. Um, and insurance can be a funding for um, in, in hospital systems and things like that. Do the people who can afford, you know, who have insurance get put ahead of the people who um, don't have insurance? And does that have a differential impact on the outcomes as well? Um, technology is important. Uh, if, you know, particularly this year, it has been, uh, you know, who has technology, who has access to completing these screeners? Um, who, uh, who is it that's kind of moving to the front because they just have access to technology? Or what if they're just more familiar and comfortable with using technology and they're more proficient, so therefore they're more likely to get that service? Scheduling too is, um, our, is testing occurring during school hours if you're in a school system. Um, in the or is it after school, in which case transportation and other issues might become an issue for um, non uh, for students that may not have uh, resources to get back home if they don't take the bus. Um, and also just group screening. Do you get do you see those are great places actually to look for differential rates of referral and how they align with your just basic um, setting. All right. Situation, whoops, did it skip one? Sorry, test selection and assignment. Test selection, is the, the are the tests that you're selecting to use um, standard? Are they, is the same test being used with everyone? Um, or are the tests being <laughs> the purpose of the assessment and match the background of the client? These are important factors to consider when you're looking at differential diagnoses across groups and also um, assignment to interventions and special programs. Um, it's important to always kind of evaluate your own examiner biases. Uh, if you um, are always seeing a certain diagnosis and you just kind of get used to this as that diagnosis, it might be time to kind of reevaluate and see if maybe that is a bias you're bringing into the assessment that everybody's going to um, follow the same pattern. There, uh, there was a wonderful uh, talk put on by the University of New Mexico where uh, we had there was a forensic psychologist who talked about how he tracked his clients and their demographics and his outcomes and his diagnoses so he could kind of just evaluate his own biases that might be appearing over time. So uh, obviously referral sources kind of dictate what types of things you might see, but if you see a certain pattern in yourself that you're always getting the same outcome, um, it might be time to evaluate. Um, all right. Is the same examiner always testing the same type of student? So is there uh, some issue with the assignment of uh, clients to particular examiners? Is the most experienced examiner always testing, you know, the most complex cases or is that most experienced examiner getting the high priority cases based on whatever the prioritization was at the referral system. Um, 
Within systems, situational bias too can occur. And this is any characteristics of the test setting. So if you're in a crowded school or in a you know crowded hospital system or a system where time and um, physical space is of, of short supply, that can obviously have an impact on clients as well. Um, characteristics of the examiner, there's been a lot of research in this area and I uh, encourage folks to go read some of the meta-analyses that are out there. Um, that you know, the big building rapport with an examinee continues to be one of the most important drivers of um, outcomes. So rapport building with various client bases and experiences is important. Do your clients come in with practice and coaching? Um, if they already know what the test procedures are or they already have an idea of how to answer, that could be creating a situational bias on the side of the client because they're already aware of where to go. And just being familiar with the testing environment often puts an examinee at advantage. Ah. And now finally, the interpretation. When you're interpreting results of a measure, um, it's important not to generalize across um, scores. So if you have multiple scores indicating the same thing, that's wonderful, but overgeneralizing a single low score or things like that may also be a problem. Misinterpretation of just general uh, is just a thing that is basic competence. I'm not implying that's a thing here, but misinterpretation, I think we've all seen reports that were kind of not the greatest ones that we've seen. Overinterpretation of a single poor result, um, as opposed to you know, looking at the, the preponderance of the evidence to use a term that is a legal term. Uh, halo effect is you know when we, the experiences that you have influence your um, can the your interpretation as well and then just misuse of measures maybe the selection the test selection that's been mandated if you're in a system that requires certain testing is not um, fitting the particular client that you're seeing so these are things to look at within your systems um, or within yourself and consider what the impact might be and the outcomes downstream. And so now we'll address just what is equity and what does that mean for assessment? So what is equity? In clinical assessment, we, um, it, it involves you use the same tool in the same way to obtain comparable results, which you then use to make diagnostic educational and other decisions. Um, equality is the equal treatment of people. Everyone is treated the same regardless of circumstance. In terms of the actual test, equality uh, we, is important. Everybody gets the same standardized administration, regardless of what they bring to the table. However, equity it is addressing the issues that impact those outcomes within the process of assessment, not just within the tools of assessment, but within the whole entire process, starting with referral to through interpretation to create more equal outcomes across groups. So this involves not just uh, dealing with test bias and administration issues, but also addressing the barriers to the full participation of clients in their and um, the backgrounds and the needs they bring. So what are some equity questions that we should be asking? Um, does the assessment answer the question or is it just what was mandated to be used? Was the assessment developed for use across settings and cultures? Um, does it, was it developed for the person that's sitting across from you when you're using it? Were appropriate measures of bias used in, uh, during the test development? You know, hold us accountable. Did we use the right measures? Is the system fairly referring and screening clients? And are the tools that are, you have used fairly? Um, is the assessment process creating similar outcomes across groups, or are you starting to see overrepresentation in, um, you know, of the of the majority group in beneficial, high level programs, and then the uh, minority groups being marginalized in the programs that they're being used? Uh, so these are things that we have to ask. Not just um, we have to ask ourselves these on a regular basis. This is how we um, address equity issues. So how do we move forward as a field or fields? I know there are multiple fields available uh, in attendance today. How do we achieve equity? I think number one, we have to talk about it. We can't relegate equity to something that we think about um, on a 
uh, on an occasion when we're meeting with people, but we got to talk about equity in our systems and equity within our tests. You need to stay vigilant uh, for test bias. Um, while there is little evidence of consistent test bias in modern tools, it was definitely there and had repercussions for generations in the past. Um, we need to stay vigilant. We can't drop um, this focus on tests being uh, diminishing bias in tests. And so we, you know, maybe there are new techniques. Maybe some of you guys out there listening today have ideas on ways to evaluate and investigate bias. Um, and we need to stay, you know, rigorous investigation on this um, and inspect the developer's data on this. We need to increase, rep uh, sorry, increase representation in the development of tests. Now, not, this is not just in our formal content teams in publishing companies or within research communities, but also just among our expert reviewers, our customers, our um, administration, you know, administrations that we work under, the legislative mandates who, you know, mandate what tests get used in what systems. We need to have greater representation of all groups in those areas. Um, and we need these folks also to engage and participate in customer research, in focus groups, in feedback sessions, uh, you know, share, see it, say it. <laughs> um, we need to match test selection to the needs of the examinee. So, um, we need to get back to, you know, the training that we got in graduate school when we were learning about tests, what fits the needs of the examinee and has the best predictive value for the outcomes that you're looking for, for that client. Um, we need to evaluate the systems in which you operate, um, which I operate, which we all operate in. We need to be aware of where those systems might be creating unintentional or intentional bias or unfairness to uh, different populations. Um, and we need to continue learning. And I think this, this gets also back to talking about equity all the time, but it's also continue listening and learning. And in that context, I wanna kind of mention what future webinars we have coming up in this series. Um, the next one is on February 8th, and it's gonna be on promoting equity by reducing exclusionary disciplinary actions within a multi-tiered system of supports. Uh, and it's gonna be, we're gonna then address at the end of February, equitable practices for English language learners. And then in, th in March through May, you're going to see these, these dates haven't been set yet, but as they are set, you'll see them on our website. The use of translators in assessment, the cross-cultural use of the Wexler scales, social justice issues in cognitive assessment. And uh, we're going to end this series uh, with a demographics adjustments panel so that they can discuss um, what are the benefits and difficulties with using these demographic adjustments to our norms. And um, with that, I really appreciate your attention today and I'm gonna open it up for questions. Susie, do we have any questions? You said we need to make a, a awareness of a hard stop in five minutes. Okay. Yes. Apologies. I was trying to, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Susie, okay. hold on one second. We just want to alert everybody in five minutes, this, um, the live studio will shut down. It has an automatic stop at the end of the presentation. If you have typed in a question and we don't answer it in the next five minutes, please include it in your survey after that will be sent to you. And we will ensure that you get that answered. But the, um, the questions that were asked during the presentation are not held by the system. So you may need to retype it if your question is not answered. Okay, Susie. Okay, uh, Lisa, we have a question. As gender has been a major norming variable for many tests, specifically behavior rating scales, how will transgender identification be addressed? That is a great, great question. Um, and one that we, we actually have a work group here within Pearson that is looking at um, gender issues. I think, yeah, historically we have stratified by the binary um, designation and they're all self-reported gender or sex designations. And those are based on census. So we have a work group currently um, 
we're looking into this issue onto how we might be able to address this um, uh, this population that is not binary identifying. Uh, there's not an easy answer because they're uh, they do not at this point reach um, the five percent inclusion for stratification. So, uh, but I think they def that definitely needs to be addressed. That's a great question. And if that uh, whoever asked that question, if you have advice for our team, they are actively working on this right now. And would love their input. So. Okay, here is another question. The discussion to equity and administration makes me wonder whether it would make sense to have different standardized presentation for different groups of individuals. Well, that's an interesting question, suggestion. Um, that's a great comment. Um, and I do think that with modifications and accommodations that happens currently, but that would allow different kind of norming procedures for those populations. Um, I'm thinking through some of the logistical issues of that in terms of just large in samples. It's very difficult to do that. But um, right now you're kind of stuck in a position where if you do those types of things, they're listed as accommodations and modifications and you then interpret based on those. But that's an interesting suggestion. I think I might take that back to our scientific council here and, um, discuss that. There are certain tests that we have, particularly in our language um, area, where things like that are allowed, uh, like bilingual assessments, where they, if the child was has differential knowledge across languages, they can um, ask the questions in both languages um, and accommodate. Well, that's and that's actually built into the test. So it would be similar in that manner. Interesting, interesting, interesting point. I like it. Here's another one. Are minorities or individuals from other cultural backgrounds represented in the test development community? Yes, we do. We have we have quite a few representation. Um, let, we are a very small community, <laughs> and many, um, but they are definitely represented. We have um, quite a few here at Pearson. I, I can't speak to other publishers but they are represented, but we could always um, use different voices. So uh, if that is something you're interested in, send a note. I think Peter's email was on the um, end of the yes. handouts. So if he will pass on anything to our development group, or if it's something you wanna learn more about, we'd love to hear from you. But these are great, great thoughts.